Please come up, there's better seats up here. There's plenty of room. Uh, Steve Bowes is our Planning and Boundaries Director, but he is actually out of town today, so I'll be pulling double duty today. So the idea of this meeting is to run briefly through as fast as we possibly can some presentation materials and save the bulk of our time for your questions. But hopefully we're able to address a number of your questions in the presentation itself. So I wanted to, by way of introduction, again, introduce myself. And um, I'm going to acknowledge tonight that uh, I am in fact a hillbilly. Um, I'm missing my front tooth. I hope everybody's doing great tonight. Um, I lost my flipper. I had dental surgery several months ago and I'm waiting for a new tooth. And uh, I, they give you a little flipper, uh, temporary tooth. And uh, I guess I weigh too many chocolates this weekend, pulling it in and out, and I can't find it anywhere. And I've searched many in garbage can and other locations. So I asked my wife, she says, what are you going to do? And I said, well, let's see. I've got this meeting tomorrow night, which was tonight. Um, so that'll make a great impression. Um, I have school board meeting tomorrow night, so that'll be awesome. And then I present to the principals on Wednesday, so even better, I get my new flipper on Thursday. So just in time for all my major meetings to be taken care of for the week. So I'm just embracing the inner hillbilly. I'm going to go eat a hot pocket after this and watch the NASCAR and uh, embrace my heritage and uh, my roots. So. I hope you'll bear with me and I hope I don't scare any small children. So with that, um, it is a little warm in here if you haven't noticed. We have an amazing system here at Kearns High School which is able to either keep your room temperature at 80 degrees or 60 degrees, but not 70 degrees. We're not allowed to have 70 degree temperatures. I've talked to our principal about that and he has maintenance working on that, but it is one of our older facilities you, as you can imagine. So it's as they continue to work with that, so we apologize. Who knew a couple days ago that it was going to be 74 degrees outside today, right? So on one hand, it might be a little warm in here, but <clears throat> who's grateful that it's warm outside? Raise your hand. I will take it. So if at some point I get a little sweaty, I may take off my jacket, then I'll apologize for that in advance as well. We do have some other individuals here I want to recognize um, as part of this process. If you are a board member for Granite School District, would you raise your hand, please? We have Karen Winder over here. Chris Wynn, our board vice president, is here. And I see Connie Burgess over here. And I don't think I'm missing anybody. We may see uh, a couple other board members sneak in as they're able as well. And uh, I'll describe board members and their role in this process um, in a little bit. We have administrators here with us tonight from some of our local schools. So we have uh, Wendy from Western Hills. I see John Adams, who's one of our uh, principal supervisor. I see Millicent from Bridger. And uh, Danny Sterling, I already mentioned, from Kearns High School. He's going to step out and go to a banquet here. World Basketball? Yeah, okay, in a second. So uh, give him a shout out. Oh, yeah. Who am I missing? There you go. Thank you so much for being here. All right, um, if you are uh, Todd Haber, say hi. This is our business administrator, Todd Haber, as well, and he's, he's joining us as well. Matt Sampson is helping us out. Uh, this is being recorded and will be placed on the website, as well as the, the next meeting, which I think is next Monday. Um, so if you aren't able to attend tonight, you can see that. You will also have Spanish subtitles on it, so that will be helpful as well. Um, our next meeting will also be recorded in case there's other questions that come up in those meetings that anybody can see that content material. Uh, with respect to that, I have Gaina up here. Raise your hand. She's rock solid and helped get everything set up for tonight as well. As Julianne Hamlin, who's outside probably working the main table. And uh, they're the brains of the operation, so make sure you thank them uh, for helping to get everything set up for us tonight. Um, I just show up and, and smile and scare small children. That's what my job is. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to fly through this presentation. When I mean fly, I'm going to go really fast. But the idea, again, is if we can get through some of this, these base questions and help people understand the process, that actually helps uh, address a number of questions. And then we'll leave the bulk of the time uh, for your questions. And we have microphones up here uh, uh, so you, everybody can hear what those questions are. And I'm happy to walk around with the wireless mic as well. So, 
Population analysis studies. Maybe this, maybe I need to get a little closer. There we go. So I'm going to go through some basic elements of the who, what, where, when, how, and why. How many of you were in the school community council joint meeting uh, about a month or so ago? You would have seen uh, the overarching portions of this presentation. If there were questions that came up at those meetings, we tried to include that information here. So the who on all this is first and foremost you, right? Uh, part of it you'll see as this process plays out over the next year um, that uh, stakeholder feedback is pretty darn critical and we have different stages of the process that we're going to go through and uh, whether you're a community member or a teacher, an employee, uh, your voice matters and will be uh, a key element of this. Steve Hogan, who's not able to join us tonight, myself, um, helped lead our population analysis committee. I'll get to that in a second. Our Board of Education um, obviously makes the final decision after uh, we've gone through the entirety of the process. And our population analysis committee made up of 30 plus individuals from the district and from the community to help us make various recommendations. The task of these directors and individuals is to advocate for their area of expertise. For instance, if you're the director of transportation, you know and understand transportation laws. Um, you can help provide feedback and impact uh, on potential uh, solutions on our population analysis committee. This is not a scout meeting. We don't swear oaths or anything like that or work on merit badges. We simply work on uh, population analysis issues, boundaries, and school closures. So you see uh, other individuals who might be part of that, special education, uh, preschool services. Uh, we have all of our school leadership improvement directors on that committee because they supervise our schools and they're in touch and they know their communities better than we do. And so uh, while, while Steve directs that process and I assist him, um, this is the committee that ultimately makes the recommendations after looking and evaluating all of your feedback and comments. So with respect to that, we have two areas of, stu I'm sorry, two studies we're considering for this go around. And I'm gonna talk about the process here in a little bit, but really at this point in stage, um, it, there's a lot of rumors that circulate. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. If somebody is telling you that something has happened or a decision is made, I would stay away from that person because they don't know what they're talking about. We have not drawn any conclusions. The only thing we've done at this point in time is say, we're going to study areas one and two for these reasons. We're going to study it for potential closures of one to two elementary schools and for the bringing back of Brockbank Junior High as Cypress High opens. So area one, um, I'm gonna bring this up here maybe. Yes, you can see area one is the furthest west area. Area two is the area that we're in right now. We held a meeting last Thursday. Thursday in area one and we'll be over in the Hunter area uh, next Monday. Anybody can come to any of the meetings um, so if you want to come to multiple meetings, you really love a good public meeting, um, I'd encourage you to come to that one as well. Again, it will be recorded and all that information will be shared. Last year, we studied Area 4. And as part of that study, we considered modifications to uh, networks and feeders, and we closed three schools, okay? Now, you might be asking, why are we closing schools? We're going to get to that in a second, and I'll explain that. We anticipate being in Area 3 next year and then going back up to Area 5 in the year 2025, 2026, at some point in time. And uh, the, these areas are actually developed by an independent demographer based on elementary populations. These are, uh, when we're talking about school closures, we are not talking about secondary schools. We are only talking about elementary schools because that is where the demographer has said, you used to have 78,000 kids and you had 90 plus schools, well, now you have 59,000 kids and you still have the same amount of buildings, okay? And so that, all that data was collected pre-COVID. We obviously didn't work to close any schools in the midst of a global pandemic and, you know, an earthquake and a lot of other factors. But now it's time that we consider some of the small school concerns that we've been experiencing in our networks and in our schools and address some of those concerns. And I'm going to get to that here in a second. If it will click, go ahead if you don't mind. Can I just tell you next slide, would that be okay? So here's what those areas look like in focus. Um, again, are we looking at school closures? I just want to be very transparent about this process. In area ones where we're still experiencing some measure of growth, and the answer's 
Probably not, and probably not anywhere along the periphery or the eastern portion of between areas one and two because we could experience growth in those areas as well. Um, Director of Planning and Boundaries, Steve Hogan, his job is uh, primarily to not only lead this process and walk people through it, but it is also to manage and monitor growth within the school district. So he is constantly working with local municipalities, the county, to identify growth and uh, pres uh, areas where we might see increased households and other things of that nature. And just because you might get an influx of residents um, doesn't always necessarily mean that you're going to have more students. For instance, when we were in Area 4, along that 700 East Van Winkle Corridor last year, the number of those communities, Mill Creek City and South Salt Lake City in particular, had received over 7,000 new units, and yet their population had still declined. For instance, Wilson Elementary, which is downtown South Salt Lake City, went from about 600 students to just a little over 300 in a, in a four or five year period. And why is that? You get 7,000 new units and no new kids? Well, who can afford a luxury two bedroom apartment in what is now considered new downtown um, that's probably $22,000 a month, $2,500 a month? Certainly young families aren't purchasing those types of homes. So the type of growth that we're looking for that would really have an impact on our school populations are generally larger townhomes, three, four bedroom townhomes, or single family dwellings, uh, not just necessarily more apartments. So not all growth is, tr is created equal. Next slide, please. So uh, the why of our study, why do we consider small, uh, why are we considering closing potentially some of our locations and adjusting boundaries? Because primarily we have understood and we have identified that a lot of the challenges associated with quality academic outcomes is really as a result of some of our smallest schools. And uh, let me explain what that means. We have a couple of things that might be uh, included in this. And if you're a parent or a teacher, you probably can identify a few of these or relate to them. Um, nobody likes to be in a split grade, okay? So when you have a smaller school population, you might only have one or two teachers per grade level, and sometimes those grades are required to be split uh, based on the ways that those populations pan out in any individual uh, school. When we have smaller school populations, such as only two, 300 students, now let's be clear, when I say small school, I'm talking three teachers per grade level or less. That is how our population analysis committee defines small school. And I want to be clear, just because you might have three teachers or less per grade level does not automatically mean you're slated for closure, right? And I'm going to talk about all the rationale that we uh, take into consideration before, uh, as part of this process. So when you are a smaller school population, you tend to have a smaller population to draw parental support and volunteers from, right? There's less parents to be involved and engaged to serve on the PTA, to serve on a school community council. How many of you are in a PTA? Any of you? How many of you are also on a school community council? Okay. Generally in our smaller school populations, it's the same 10 people, right? Because those are the people doing the bulk of the work. So it can be a real big challenge for some of our smaller schools, very impressive in terms of uh, weight and uh, workload for our parents to provide the support that we'd like to see in any in respective school community. Can you go back to that? Sorry, I'm not done. That's okay. If you're a teacher or you're an administrator in a small school population, we have things that are called PLCs, or professional learning communities. And what that allows us to do is for our teachers at a great level to collaborate one with another and uh, come up with better outcomes for kids. Well, if there's only one or two of you, um, uh, or a onesie, or uh, it's really hard to collaborate when there's just one or two of you, right? So we like to have three or four people for you to collaborate with. Um, we see better outcomes and we see more quality PLCs when they're a little bit bigger. And it's difficult to team teach in some of those situations. Schools get allocated funding based on numbers of students. So when you have a smaller set of, of schools or of student population, there's still all these other responsibilities that come to a school staff. So a smaller school staff has to absorb all those responsibilities, um, and they don't have uh, additional staffing to help support some of those responsibilities. Okay, next slide, please. As we kind of finish up small school concerns, it's really challenging, especially um, in small schools, to have 
again, we've already identified it here. Some of the same people serving on the school community council are also in the PTA, right? And we have, again, the same 10 people doing the, those jobs. That teacher workload, we've already kind of covered a little bit. Um, we saw with one closure just a few years ago in this very area where we had 12 teachers in a very small school. And one of those teachers, just one of those teachers under the current accountability system the state requires us to go through, was struggling. And that caused the entire, uh, think about that, uh, rise testing is what goes to a school grade, right? That's grades four through six. And for some of you schools, that's just four and five because sixth grade's now at the junior high, right? So if you have just four teachers or five teachers out of your whole entire school, that the entire school grade is based on those teachers and their performance, that's really not a, a fair outcome, but that, that's the rules of the game, right? We don't get to dictate that. That's the state's accountability system. So small schools struggle usually with higher quality outcomes because one teacher who's struggling, right? They might be a new teacher or they just might be struggling with a particular grade level, behavior issues, a number of reasons they could be having some challenges. They might just be having an off year, right? And that could actually impact the entire school grade uh, just based on one class's performance. Um, frankly, it's not an efficient use of administration and it's not very fiscally responsible. Again, as we went through the 2017 bond process, there was a number of our taxpayers who came out to those meetings and said, you're gonna raise my taxes and rebuild buildings and you're gonna rebuild buildings that you don't need and the answer is yes, we will evaluate uh, potential school closures, which is the impetus of Davis demographics coming in and providing them a number of these data points for us so that we can analyze that. And so that's where we're at. Those are the kind of the small school concerns. I don't want to put an overwhelming burden on financial costs. Uh, uh, in reality, there are several core costs that are associated with an elementary school um, and, and their ongoing operations. Paying for the school is done. That was paid for a long time ago, right? But you have a principal, you have a principal secretary, and you have usually a, a janitor that are associated with every building. And there's some fixed costs associated with running the utilities in that building, right? And so we have these facilities. We still have the same amount of facilities with less kids. And would it be a better use of taxpayer resources? Yes, if we were able to consolidate some of those locations that absolutely would save us taxpayer money. Is it an overwhelming amount of money and is it the primary rationale for school closure? No. Um, a half a million dollar operations budget to pay for utilities and salaries of those poor staff um, is not going to break our $900 million budget. But savings are savings and every, every dollar that isn't put into a building or uh, some other cost is money that could be going to a classroom, right? And uh, so that's money that we need to be cognizant of and pay attention to and make sure that we're fiscally responsible when it comes to taxpayer dollars. Next slide, please. So here we have some, some quantitative data. And the reason why this is important, and some of you are taking pictures of it, that's fine. I point out it's also on our website, this entire presentation and all the data that we're gonna present is at brandonschools.org. There's a link on the home page and you can find not only this year's study information and details, but all of the materials from last year's studies as well, so that we'd be as, as transparent as possible. So what you see, I'm gonna work, walk you through each chart here. The first column is the year the school was built, okay? Why is that important? Not really, okay? Because what's more important is the column next to it, which is the FCI score, which is the Facility Condition Index. And what that is, is a ranked score. It's actually a percentage. We're giving you the ranks because it's easier to understand. But uh, we've gone through with uh, independent engineers and analyzed every facet of our facilities from earthquake status, roof quality, how new the carpet is, how good the HVAC system is, right? All of those different things behind the walls and in front of the walls and given it a ranked score. So if you look over on the right side and you look at South Kearns Elementary, which was built when? 2020? It is ranked number 64. And you're like, man, 64 is not a very good number. But what that is telling us is that 64 is actually the best school in terms of condition. It is brand spanking new, right? And then you see what is the number one school below it? West Kearns. It is the next school slated for rebuild because of its condition, right? It is in fact the worst facility in terms of overall condition 
in the entire elementary district. Hey. Hold, please. Karen just offered to finish the rest of the presentations. We're going to turn the time over to her. She's helping us take care of it, make sure people who watch this later actually get some sound on their, their video. So uh, I hope that explains the FCI score, and that's why we track that data, right? Is the, the facility condition an important uh, consideration when it comes to school closure? Absolutely, right? We don't want to have to rebuild a potential facility that we, we don't need right down the road. And I'll tell you right now, if you look at South Kearns Elementary, brand new, if you look at the next column of their approximate capacity, which is 675, does everybody see where I'm looking at? Right? They're kind of nodding their heads. Then let's go over to the next column on the other side to the right of South Kearns. What is their current population? 420. Is that a good use of that brand new facility to have only 420 kids in a school that can hold almost 700 students? No, that wouldn't be a very good use of taxpayer resources. So those are things we need to take into consideration. Sit. Yes. Say that again. That is a, it's dependent. It's a variable, right? Very good. So uh, sorry, I'm not done there. This is my favorite chart. We'll actually come back here. And I appreciate Dana trying to keep us on task here. So if we have color coded that um, to kind of identify uh, yellows in that not so we would like to see more kids in your school range. Green's okay, right? Three teachers per grade level for K-5, that's approximately 550 kids, right? So at a minimum, we would like to see, if we just had our way and we could snap our fingers, we'd love to see 550 kids in every school. That means there would be three teachers per grade level uh, to be able to PLC with. You'd have a sufficient amount of population to help staff your, P, uh, your PTA, your school community council. Um, and a lot of those small concerns would go away. Is it a perfect solution? Does it always create the best academic opportunities? No, but we see some commonalities there and some patterns developing. So if you look at red, that's where we would be very concerned about your population and want to make sure you have even more students, right? So if I could instantaneously snap my fingers and be able to house more kids in these schools, I would do so. But what Davis Demographics told us several years ago is that your peak was 78,000 in the late 70s, early 80s, and mid, uh, almost through the early 90s. We started 14 years ago when I started with Grand School District, we had 68,000 kids. We have 59,000 kids today, okay? Davis Demographics, and yet we have the same amount of facilities roughly. Okay, so we've lost eight, almost 9,000 students because of normal, natural attrition, because of competition from charter schools and some other variables, we've lost a significant portion of our students, right? And there's gonna work through its way through the process and it's, a, and it's time and it's appropriate for us to evaluate that further. So uh, we're gonna come back to this chart uh, a little bit later, but I did wanna point out, if you see under the student population portion where it shows one population number and then another in parentheses, that parentheses number is what that school would be roughly estimate if it was only K-5 uh, grade size. So some of those schools still have sixth grade within them. All those are anticipated to be rolled over into a K-5 configuration in the fall of 2025. As we finish the uh, Westlake Junior will be open in the Granger Network and Cypress High will be open at that point in time and we can reopen Rock Bank. Again, the other aspect of this study. Okay, next slide, please. So this is uh, going through, this little snake chart infographic is the most critical portion of how our process and procedure works. So as quickly as possible, I said a little bit earlier, if somebody says they know what's gonna happen, they know what uh, schools were gonna close, the pack, well, they know something I don't because Population Analysis Committee has made no recommendations. 
and we won't make any formal recommendations until about the fall of this year. We'll actually take all of your feedback this summer and work through that. So let's walk through the calendar just really quickly. December through February, our Population Analysis Committee identifies the greatest areas of concern, the greatest priorities. We have actually a lot of concerns throughout Granite School District. A boundary that needs to be adjusted over here. Uh, a, a high school that has too many kids in it and the feeder needs to be potentially adjusted. Those are ongoing concerns. Just like our schools are always striving to continuously improve, our boundaries are in the same process. There's a continuous process, and we forever, through the dawn of time, all the way until it, it's all over, will continue on an annual basis to make recommendations and make adjustments to boundaries, because at the end of the day, we want all of our schools to have a sufficient amount of population uh, to draw from. I did want to point out Clark Nelson over here, uh, wave your hand, he's another one of our board members that was able to join us tonight. I didn't see any others. There's Julie Jackson. She's standing in the aisle up there as well. So we have, oh, and Nicole, our board president, uh, joined us. She actually represents this, uh, the overwhelming portion of this area. So thank you for being here as well. Okay, so through that February time frame, we, we come to the Board of Education, we make suggestions on what we think areas need to be studied. All right, the board actually has to approve which areas to study. They did so in the February board meeting. Guess what you can find on the website? That presentation that describes um, the, uh, which areas we want to study, okay? Then that green portion is where we're at today. That's why I say, if somebody's telling you a decision's been made, they know something that we don't, because we would re be remiss to go through this entire process um, without asking our communities what they think first, right? So that's where we're at today. We're in the February to June time frame. We held meetings with our school community councils, some joint meetings several weeks ago, and now we're doing our full public uh, community meetings today, right? And uh, next week, we held one last Thursday, and we will go back over the next several weeks to schools who would like additional information, and Steve and I will hold four meetings as appropriate. Last year, as part of that study process, we held over 90 public meetings. Yes, nine zero. okay? This year I'm hoping to get to see my family a little bit more, right? And so we've actually consolidated a number of these meetings. Uh, we used to kind of go school by school, but because we're still at the early stages of this process, and we really don't know exactly what details we're going to go into, we haven't asked you yet, right? Um, we, we wanted to kind of combine some of those meetings. The other part of that that's critical is, it uh, looks like I've got some Western Hills folks here. Raise your hand, say hello. I got some Bridger folks. I think I saw Millicent or folks, okay, right? And I have how many other school communities represented here, right? I want you to be able to hear from each other, right? I think that's pretty critical. And if I just went out to Western Hills, I would know exactly how they felt, but none of you would know how they felt, right? And I want you to know what they have to say and so on and so on. Okay, in June, oh, by the way, everything that we talk about tonight, she is writing down. Dana is up here, she's taking vigorous notes, recorded the meeting, any comment that comes in through our website, the surveys that we'll send out, um, anything that comes to us via email is all compiled. That's not a threat, by the way. This is just information we want to be transparent about and share with our board members who ultimately will make the decision, right? So in June, we will have to come back, Population Analysis Committee, and we'll have to make a recommendation on continuing with this study or abandoning it, all right? And at that point in time, we will start to hone in on just a, a few more details. We'll probably, when we come to this table and in the, in the process as we start, we start with every potential option. And the reason we do that is we don't want anybody to assume that we've made up our minds when we have not gone through the entirety of this process. And the important part of that is the last chart showed you a lot of good quantitative data. There's a lot of numbers, but do they tell the whole story? No. And are uh, small school concerns, are they the whole picture? No. And is, even though I've been to every single one of your schools probably multiple times, do I know every little innate detail about your community? No. So that's what we're here to do tonight. We're here to see the qualitative side 
of this information so that we can take those comments and those questions and those concerns, then they can help shape our decisions moving forward, okay? So we will take every comment, we'll take your name off of it, and uh, we'll post it on the website, we'll share it with the board, we'll share it with PAC. So you don't have to worry about emailing every single board member and every PAC member. If you send me an email about any of this, or you send it to our boundaries email, you take the survey online, any of those pieces, you make a comment tonight, it will be reported and it will be shared across uh, all those individuals who have a role in this decision. Okay, so now, sorry, I'm not quite done yet. June, July, that little aqua time frame is when we start formulating some strategies based on the information you told us. Now, are we going to look at some quantitative data? Yes, of course we are. But now we're hoping to have a better idea and understanding of some of the questions or concerns you might have within your respective communities or things that we need to take into consideration. Some of those might be at-risk features of your school, right? Some of them might have to do with the quality of your programming, right? Um, but a lot of it does come to some of the numbers that we're seeing. So we need to take all that and each of, as we've gone through this process over the years, it's kind of interesting how some of these studies have taken on a little bit of a personality of their own. So I'm kind of curious to see what the personality of this particular study will be and what the concerns that will rise to the top will ultimately be. In July and August, we will formally publicize our recommendations. Last year, we were looking at potentially one to three closures across nine schools. And as we took those number of students in those nine schools, we had two schools that were sub 200. Now, what was critical about that is not only were they sub 200, but in one of those situations, 190 kids were special permitting to go somewhere else, okay? What does that tell you about that particular school? People did not want to be in that particular location, and they told us why, right? And we had all that data, right? And another school had almost 150 kids that were special permitting out of that location. So people, our community, our customers were voting. All right, and that was hard information to ignore, okay? So if you go to the website today and you look under the 2023 study, there's a chart called Student Mobility Day. And it actually has all the district schools and it shows how many kids have left for charter schools, how many are special permitting out to other potential locations. We track a number of different data points to try and understand what's happening within each of our respective school communities. So we will take all that data we will take all of your data in terms of comments that you provide to us and ideas or suggestions on what you think you would like to see in an enhancement of your boundary or an adjustment of your boundary. Um, and we will start to make recommendations. Last year, again, we were looking at one to three school closures. But as we took the total number of schools, if we didn't close anything less than three schools, we could not even scratch the surface of getting any of those schools to the 550 plus range. And so we made the hard and difficult decision to make a recommendation to close three schools. So we came up with three different school closure plans and took those back out to the public, all right? So this coming September, in August, those plans would be publicized or early September, and we would then have more meetings just like this or we will provide you with the three potential, three to four, it could be six, it, whatever PAC wants to bring to the public. Now, when PAC was do, going through this process, we literally sat in the middle of a hot July summer and we brought out all these maps and all the committees broke into groups and we had five or six groups and we literally made them go through the process of identifying uh, one to three school closures with every school within that study area, all nine of those schools, including uh, Walker Elementary, which is a brand new school, and you're saying, Ben, why would you consider the closure of Walker Elementary? We want to run the numbers, we want to say that we had analyzed that information. And you will see us go through that same process, we will analyze a potential closure of every school within that study area. That study area might have shrunken by now, remember I talked about in July, that we might come back and actually shrink the study area or hone in on a couple areas. Several years ago we did that. We only ended up looking at, uh, when Sandberg Elementary was closed, we looked at three elementaries to consolidate into two. 
and we wanted to know and understand what that would look like from each of those. So you could see us doing that. We could keep it broad and study all 27 elementary schools in the study area, right? We want to keep a lot of options on the table and make sure that we get a lot of good quality feedback. So in September, that is when you will actually see some data turned into um, some actual plans. Now some of you are saying, Ben, why don't you have some plans and studies tonight? Well, if I didn't come and ask you first what you thought, then the decision would have already been made. And if we're not asking our communities what we don't know and what we don't understand about your individual respective communities, then we're not doing our job. Okay? So, um, our job is to listen tonight, and we will get to that part here in a second. Finally, after we go through some more community meetings, um, we ended up holding about 12 after those were publicized last September. We went back out to some individual schools, and we asked a, a lot more questions to make sure we understood all the implications. And Population Analysis Committee made one final recommendation with some adjustments, right? Because we got some more feedback on those plans or those uh, proposals. Made some more adjustments and made one final proposal to the Board of Education. The Board has to then vote on it two different times. It'll be in the November and the December Board meeting. What will the Board do? I don't know, guys. I don't know. So somebody, again, who says they know exactly what's going to happen, they know something I don't. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you how the board will vote, right? They're each their own board members and they represent their respective areas and they're going to listen to what we have to say and ultimately they're going to make the decision that they want to make. Can they make adjustments for our proposals? Yes. Can they throw our proposals out and take out, uh, uh, come up with their own new proposal at that point in time? Yes. It will entirely be up to the board at that point in time, and you will have the opportunity to comment to them, not just in these open houses, but in the, there's actually public hearings set uh, two different times, in November and December at those respective board meetings, and the board is required by law to hear and listen uh, to every comment that comes as part of that process. So that is how that process works. You might be asking, Ben, why does this run on a calendar year instead of in, in the same timeline as a school year? Well, if the board makes a decision in December, that gives us a lot of lead time to make preparations for transitions and school transitions. So those three school closures took, uh, were voted on in December. Those schools will close this May, and we will enact those new boundaries this coming fall. That gives us a lot of time to communicate, make sure everybody knows what their new school location would be, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. All right, remember, We've gone through a couple of, of main factors here, but each study takes on a personality of its own, so I don't know what will be the pre uh, presiding concerns that come from your comments um, that we will need to analyze and think through as a population analysis committee, but a lot of things um, that come through, here's about half a dozen of about 18 that are in our actual policy, but our policy is very clear to, say, to indicate that we will consider these things and anything else that comes up. And so what we need from you tonight is things that we need to know and understand and potential suggestions about how we can improve and enhance your boundary, right? And any other questions or concerns you might have, that's really what we're after tonight. So small consult school concerns, we've gone through that. Future enrollment, as we kind of look to the future, we have a pretty good crystal ball looking out several years about what your, your enrollment might look like because we know what your your kindergarten population is, so we have a pretty good idea of what your third and fourth grade might look like down the road, right? With uh, Within uh, some margin of error. Your facility condition, we've talked about that already, why that's important. Transportation, right? I got accused last year at one of those meetings of, of not wanting to provide busing to one of our schools as part of uh, one of the proposals that was made. And I said, you know what? You got me. I don't want to provide transportation. I want your kid to be able to walk to school, if possible, right? Um, we get reimbursed for every route that's authorized under state law, so it's not saving the district money to cut transportation routes, but it, it's intrinsic that our community schools actually be community walkable school communities, right? And so safe walking routes is certainly part of that, and fiscal considerations could be part of that process. Fiscal considerations in terms of ongoing savings are minimal, but if we don't have to spend $35 million to rebuild a school that we no longer need, 
you can imagine some of the people here probably worked in schools. How many of you in this room do not have a child in the school right now? Raise your hands high. Okay? Probably a lot of our employees. But you're also, we hear from taxpayers. And this invitation was sent out to every household within the study area. Because we do hear from taxpayers who don't like paying for schools. Um, and, you know, they feel like they've already done their part. They've paid their taxes. They've already sent their kids to our schools. And they, they struggle to see why we would uh, continue to have facilities that we don't stand in need of anymore. So physical consideration is up there. Is there a primary thing? Again, not necessarily. All right, next slide, please. So here we are. We held the meeting last week. I guess it was Wednesday, not Thursday. I don't know what day it is. Um, next week, we'll be at Hunter High School. Same bad time, same bad channel, same bad presentation. Okay? Because all we're doing at this point in time is we're not making any decisions. We're just soliciting feedback and input. So if you get on this QR code, if you write a comment tonight, if you ask a question, we'll continue to promulgate this information and share it with the community. So if you come tonight and you have a great question, we're going to throw it on the website, we're going to share it with the broader community, and everybody will be able to hear that information. And no one understand it. So the QR code takes you to the direct link on the website, but if you go to brandonschools.org, the link's right there on the homepage, okay? Next slide, please. I, there's one more on reconfiguration. Oh, yeah. We're not going to talk about reconfiguration because this community is already reconfigured. But as part of this study, um, we're considering reopening Rock Bank Junior High. Cyprus is on a K6, 7, 8, 9, 12 reconfiguration, as is the Hunter Junior feeder because they're split feeder with Cyprus, and as is the Granger Network, who was going through the reconfiguration process. And we helped and started that process, and then there was this, this global pandemic, and there was an earthquake. Does anybody remember the earthquake? I remember the earthquake, right? So Westlake is now in the process of being rebuilt, and uh, we were not able to reconfigure at that time. So all that reconfiguration conversation is happening within the Cypress and Granger portions of the study. That decision will be formalized after this process is done. And the reason that is, is if we're going to reopen Rock Bank, we have to hold a population boundary study to determine what that boundary would be before we can make a decision to whether to reopen it or not, right? Okay, so I'm not going to go on to that anymore. And now, let's see how well I did. It's 646, and we have roughly, why don't we say we'll go till about 730, uh, answering general questions, and then I'll hang out as long as necessary after that. I guess it's 45 solid minutes uh, to go through any questions you might have. If we need to go longer, we can go longer. I'm happy to stay as long as is necessary, but I think we can probably get a lot done in, in 45 minutes, so let's see how it goes. Who's going to step up with our first question? All right, comes right here.
And now, you guys are saying it's on the schools. I mean, the population is growing, a lot of people need to state. And you guys are saying, oh, it's because we're losing students to charter school. Maybe there's a problem. Maybe because those people are trying to make sure that their children is preparing the best education possible. Because education is one of the biggest conditions for a child's growth. So, um, and the other thing is that uh, we're on two questions here. I want to make sure I remember them all. That's all right. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, you're doing just great. Like, and the other thing is like, if we have small schools and you think you're saying that, oh, it's because you're small teacher, you know, because you're brand new teachers, and that's where we need to step in and help those teachers get in. Because it's starting a new job, it's a really hard process. It's not the same as studying to become a teacher, as being a teacher. You know, they have to have a lot, a lot, I mean, a lot of assistance. And to becoming the professors that we want for our kids and the professors that they dream of. Very good, thank you. So, first and foremost, um, right. clapping for him just Thank you, sir. Appreciate your thoughts. Um, I was here when Brandon and I closed as well. There was 255 kids in a building that used to hold 18 months. We were subsidizing additional teachers to make sure that we could have a, enough teachers to provide a comprehensive education. So you're right, the class sizes were smaller than they were than any other high school in the district. And that's not fair. It's not fair that Certain kids in small school situations received additional funding and supports that we weren't able to provide every school in the district. Okay, so how our FTE works? FTE means full time equivalent or teacher. If there's a thousand kids in a school, our district takes that number based on the money given to us by the legislature. We divide that thousand dollars or those thousand kids by our FTE count, which is 27.25. I know we don't cut actual kids into quarters, just to be clear, okay? But then we take that number, we round it up, and we allocate that school with a thousand kids, that many teachers. Then you as a school community council make recommendations to your principal who ultimately decides how they're going to staff a school. So in a small school situation, just know that we're paying for more teachers than our regular size schools are getting. And frankly, is that a good use of resources? So to say that class sizes are smaller is not technically accurate. It was accurate in Grand High because we were subsidizing because it was such a small school population. And you have to have so many teachers to teach all the various subjects. That was the rationale actually for its closure at the time. I'm sorry that you had a difficult experience, I really am. But I want you to know that we actually tracked all 255 of those kids and the vast majority of them were actually much better at their new school locations because they had access to so many other teachers, programs, classes that they didn't get because we didn't have a large enough population uh, to provide uh, you know, a full-time drama teacher, a full-time choir teacher, and some of the programs that never existed at Granite High because we just simply did not have enough kids. So to be clear, your class sizes will not change as a result of a school closure because our teachers follow the kids, right? So if one school population goes up higher to another 125 kids, we're gonna take that 125, divide it by 27.25, and give that school that many more teachers now, does that mean the, in a school closure situation, those exact teachers would follow those kids? No. There's a whole process under their contractual agreement with the Granite Education Association and process that we have to follow. But we try to listen to our teachers and do what they would like us to do in those situations. So when we move or shift or have one or two school closures in this area, does that mean class sizes will increase in those other schools that absorb those kids? No, you'll get more teachers to go with those kids. And that's what happened when we just closed these three schools. Those other teachers have now been allocated um, and now been picked up by remaining schools within Grand School District. And because we are a large school district, we can actually accommodate a number of those, of those challenges. So we talked about FTE, and you had one other thought or question. I, I would have no doubt that in a small school situation like Granite High, 
is very different than what we're faced with today because a secondary closure is much more complex or different than an elementary closure. Um, in an elementary closure, your kid's dealing with one teacher, not multiple teachers, right? And those staffing resources are allocated at a different rate. We don't have school counselors at every, uh, to, to help our guidance counselors at the elementary level, right? And those are all staffed at a certain ratio. I have no doubt that one school counselor was able to get with 255 kids. The overall ratio in the, in the district is like one, 1 to 389. So all of our other high schools, you had one counselor trying to track down almost 400 students. So you, you're absolutely right. If I got more, if we as a school district, not me personally, got more money from the legislature, instead of being the second lowest funded um, uh, educational entity in the entire United States, we would love to beef up supports, not just for more teachers, but more school psychologists, more guidance counselors, more administrative support, more paraprofessionals. How about paying parents more money, right? There's a lot of things that we could do that have nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight that provide a better quality education. I want to be really clear. If we can't come up with a single solution up here in terms of uh, reduce, increasing school sizes to an appropriate level, we're not talking about a thousand kids in an elementary here. We're talking about bringing them up to a, a base level where they can have the support they need to function, right? Can you have too big of a school population? Yup. Are we even close to that? Did you see those numbers? Did you see our capacity? This isn't the 80s anymore where we're bursting into the seams. Right? And so our goal, I think, is your goal, and that's to provide a quality educational experience to your kids. We wouldn't make any of these recommendations if we didn't feel like it was going to improve student outcomes. Next question. All right, I have a concern and a question. Sure. I just hope that as you guys are doing this, you take into consideration that we did just have a closure in our neighborhood four years ago. And we're still, we've been able to build that model, but there, it was a trajectory now. So I hope that that's something you guys take in consideration that to have another community go through another closure so soon would be a hard thing. Um, the next thing, I just have a question. Okay. And it's got it. All right, and so that impacts three of the schools of one neighborhood. Um, I might believe that that would also include South Coast and West Coast. Because, yeah. It was over. Right. right. Um, my other question is, I'm a social worker. I know that teacher jobs are protected. Staff, when we know that we are now fully, um, we have our, our support staff in all the schools, so now we have these extra staff. So if you could answer that for me, I'd appreciate that. And that's actually that's a great question. We try to follow the same process that we're uh, contractually obligated to uh, with those types of staffing. Um, we how that process roughly works is that we look at where our overall populations are for the spring. We actually just went through this process, right? We analyze what we think numbers will be next fall. We develop a new uh, uh, ratio, and we start allocating resources to those schools, saying you will have this need for teachers, this many social workers, you're eligible for this, now start your hiring process. And so those who have been surplused as part of a, a potential school closure would then be able to be first to, to be interviewed for those positions. But again, being a large district has its advantages because of the economies of scale. And in every reconfiguration we've had, and out of the six schools that we've closed now, I have not, we've not had a single reduction in force, meaning we've not had to lay off a single employee. We've been able to find a spot for every employee, and that goal remains unchanged. Thank you. That's called a split feeder, just so we're all using the same. Is that taken into effect? And if it is, how is that, how is that in the mix? That's a great question. Uh, so a split feeder, again, is when you might have an elementary that feeds into two different junior highs, or a junior high that feeds into two different um, high schools. And as a population analysis committee, we abhor split feeders. We would love for every school to go from this school have all that inclusion and that friendships go on to this school and you find some more friends within the same area and region and then you go on to that high school and that really builds that community up and split Peters detract from community-oriented schools. 
And so we try to avoid them as often as possible, but sometimes it's just not feasible, right? So the reason, uh, as we look at the Brockbank reopening, Hunter Junior High is a split feeder to Cypress and to Hunter High. Our goal will be to clean that up. Will we be successful? I don't know. We haven't come up with any recommendations yet, so your guess is as good as mine, but that would be the goal. Thank you for that question. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Carlos Rivas. My English is so bad. Gonzalo. El señor Gonzalo me ayudará a traducir el translator. Very good, thank you. Gonzalo is our translator tonight, so if you need translation or support tonight, he's here to help us. Can you state the question for us, Gonzalo? Based on that graphic, present it. The snake? This one? That graphic, exactly that. There is a percentage between some school in yellow Uh, that are in a range less than 1%. Yes, if we consider the capacity, the relative capacity of each school, 1% no, don't justify the difference be, between two schools. Like Vacus and uh, Western Hills, for instance. Are very similar the situation, but one is in red and the other is in yellow. What, you said Western Hills and what? And uh, the, the first, the Bacchus. Oh, yeah, Bacchus. No. So, can I answer that question? Can I answer that question? Or... So, to be clear, this is not a ratio of the population based on, on capacity. It's based on a number, uh, a range of population uh, that equates to how many, roughly, per teachers per grade level. So the greens are above the 550 range, which is kind of a, a minimum that we like to see our schools in. Yellows are a little bit lower, and red would be we would want to have more teachers and more kids in that school. But you define that three teachers for each level is in the referent to consider a low uh, performance school from another, right? So to be clear, just because you have three teachers per grade level, I'm talking about general and in average. Okay, so when we look at our overall schools, we see consistent challenges and difficulties. Does that mean a school that has Small school concerns, meaning three teachers or less per grade level. Sorry, two teachers or less per grade level. Does that mean that they have all those challenges? No, not at all. We certainly have small school populations that have a tremendous base of parental support. We see um, small school populations that are not struggling uh, with academic outcomes. We're talking about in the aggregate or the average where we see some of those challenges. And it doesn't mean you would have all those challenges, but that's what we're seeing Again, in average. Now, let's, let's talk about the uh, amount, the quantity, quantities, not percentages. Then, uh, 270 students, for, for, for take an example. Plus, the, 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 the student is coming from the pre kinder. When, when a school will be closed, the other will be gathered in different school, assigned different school, right? Those, uh, yeah, those schools, the teacher will have more a load of students. Then the attention will be less, right? For each student, proportionally. So, to be clear, what I hear is, oh boy, sorry. Education is a seed that you can put in the heart of the student, and the student continue growing. And the educative system, what we teach to our student, will grow, uh, harvest in the future. 
Okay, so what I heard and what I understood, and I want to make sure I understand the question, is the concern that if we close those schools that they will go to larger classes. is created based on how many students you have, divided by 27.25, we give that number to your teacher, or to your principal, who then creates a staffing plan. So those averages might be 32, they might be as low as 20, 24, but on average within that school, they're going to average 27.25. So that's up to the local school, the district does not make those decisions. We allow and we ask our school community councils to provide feedback, to the principals when it comes to your staffing plans, but ultimately that is a local decision. Does that make sense? Thank you. Gracias. I don't have kids in Western Hills, but it's my neighborhood. Um, I'm just going to express my feelings. Um, I feel that the neighborhood is divided by two schools, Silver Hills and Western Hills. For me, it makes sense to bring the Silver Hills kids to Western Hills because then they won't have the struggle to um, drive to Silver Hills and cross that big street. Even though there is a bridge, I think that there is going to be lots of cars there. And Western Hills is a very good school. It's a community, very warm school. We'll see how many people is here to support that. And it will break our heart if we are going to another school, even though I'm, I'm not there anymore, but it's my neighborhood. And what I see is an old neighborhood. There are um, uh, folks that are dying, folks like me that our kids grow up and move away. But also, at the same time, I see a lot of families coming and there are lots of little kids that are not yet in school. And so those are my feelings and the concern for me is that if there is an empty building in the middle of the neighborhood, it's going to attract the wrong kind of people. Um, what is going to happen with that, uh, with that um, building? So you have two thoughts there, and I want to make sure I address them both. Would you mind staying there because you're going to remind me what questions are and I want to make sure I go through them. And, and let me let me express my appreciation. Um, I, I don't want to close any schools. I don't think your school board is like super excited about cl school closures. Having gone through this process in the last several years, we want to be fair and equitable in how we make these decisions. We want to take into consideration every last detail we possibly can to make sure that we're making the right decisions. But ultimately, is there a perfect solution? that everybody's going to love at the end. When we get to November, is everybody in this room going to be super excited about the decisions that we make? No, because a school is probably going to be closed, right? And are the families in that school going to be super excited about that? Probably no more so than the Board of Education has to vote on that. Okay, so please know that we share your sentiments. Nobody's high-fiving each other at the district office after a school closure vote. It's a very emotional and challenging and difficult decision, right? And to close three schools like we did last year, really, really difficult. Nothing like that's ever been done in the state of Utah. But we make those decisions because we feel like that will be in the best interest of kids. We only make decisions ultimately because we feel like it will be in the best interest of kids. So let me just point out something here that the PAC, the PAC is going to have to take into consideration when it comes to your uh, voice. And she's recorded your comment here, right? So I know that we will take this into consideration. Right now I see 270 kids at Western Hills, right? Your building capacity is roughly 550 kids. So you have room for a little over 300, right? Am I doing that math right? Right? So that puts you at, if you had 300 more kids, you'd be at, at uh, 570, right? which is a little bit more than your capacity. And I don't want to have to move a reload over to a new building. We'd be 
because we changed the boundary, the idea would be to be in the building, right? Um, I think everybody wants to be inside of the school building, especially with all the safety and security concerns we see these days, right? So let's look at Silver Hills here for a second. They have 310 kids with a building capacity of 650. Okay, so population analysis committee will absolutely, I can tell you, we will take that into consideration. I know we will, because we're gonna take into consideration everything. But at the end of the day, we're gonna look at, okay, we can make this population 580. Did I do that right? 270 plus 310, 580 for a building that does not have that capacity. So that means we'd have to break up Silver Hills a little bit further. And my guess is the same concern that you've expressed about a closure of Western Hills, which I totally understand and appreciate. The families in Silver Hills are probably gonna feel the same way about their school, right? So you can see how we have to weigh all these different types of decisions. And just in the interest of transparency, again, no decisions have been made. We've got a facility that's not in the best of condition compared to this one, which is about average, right? So those are some of the things that PAC is gonna to have to work through and study and identify. Remind me your second question. It was related to... Oh, yes, yes, you talked about an empty building bringing the wrong element, okay? So in Granite School District, we have a lot of properties and we close six of those buildings. Some of you mentioned Ogre Hills closure, right? What's Ogre Hills currently serving as? It's our online school, right? And so we're actually using that facility because we don't want to create an attractive nuisance within a community, right? Some of our other facilities may not, they may not be in the best of condition. Spring Lane Elementary, which was closed as part of this last study, is actually one of our worst facilities. It's right up there um, in terms of condition with Western Hills and slated for rebuild at some point in time. Sandberg is on the list for rebuild, and we closed that one. Um, are we looking to demolish buildings that we have no longer, we don't want to create an attractive nuisance in the community, correct? But we also are not interested in disposing of land, okay? So under state law, if we were to sell or surplus, and you can sit down, you've been so patient with me. I don't mean to make you sweat up here, but thank you for your thoughts and your question. When we dispose of property, well, we are obligated under the law to offer that up first to the local municipality. So if a building was closed in this particular area, the entity would take Kearns. Um, the first entity that would have first right of refusal of that property would be Kearns Metro Township or uh, Salt Lake County. Okay? But I'm telling you, as a member of the Real Estate Committee and I'm looking at your Board of Education, we're not interested in selling land. It's the one thing they're not making more of, right? And we don't know what shifts may happen down the road where we may need access to that property. If there was a major earthquake, for instance, in the valley, which, you know, this happened recently, we might need that property to set up a bunch of emergency reloads to be able to house our students. Ochre Hills served as a lifeboat while we rebuilt South Kearns, right? And so we have other uses for these facilities and we would not want to leave them standing there as an attractive nuisance. We learned a lot through our experience trying to sell Granite High to South Salt Lake City. And frankly, that process uh, in, in hindsight was, was very difficult. And I wish we'd just retained the property because it was not worth trying to, to go through that process to have it end up being sold to a private developer and a bunch of other homes we put in. It'd be nice to maintain that open space. So Spring Lane, when I brought up, we've already visited with Holiday City Council. They want to take over the space for us they don't want to buy it from us, but they want to lease it from us and maintain the open space and have more soccer fields for their, their community. That's a great solution, and yet we're still going to own the property in case we need it down the road for a rebuild of some sort. So that's what we expect would happen with any closed facilities. I'm going to come to this side and then we'll come back over there. Does that make sense? Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, I understand Park. Um, I understand that the global economy. I understand the need to speak multiple languages. You're talking about taking into consideration, or you're talking about how many kids are uh, special permitting outside of the school boundaries to different schools. Are you taking into consideration the magnet program? Are you taking into consideration that I think there's only one school, maybe two schools on this side of the valley or in the current area that are doing dual immersion. A lot of our schools that 
can't afford to own version or they're just not signed up for it, how are you taking into consideration that those schools are using it, losing students to the dual immersion because it's, nice. it's a desire for their families to have that opportunity? That's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. So if you look at this chart with me really quick, you can see that we actually have identified the ALC, uh, Advanced Learning Program, DLA Spanish here, uh, Gifted and Talented and DLI at Fox Hill or Western Kearns. Fox Hills ALC is up there. And you're right, uh, Diamond Ridge has a French dual, dual language of Persian program. DLI, you said either they can't afford it or they haven't signed up. And it's, it is the latter, I want to be clear. DLI has long been considered a school level program. And 16 years ago, when many of those schools adopted DLI as a model, um, we let them decide that as a local school community. It's as we've kind of gone through this process, and particularly last year's study, it became clear that a number of our schools need a little bit more district level intervention and support uh, to make sure that those programs are maintained according to the state model. And to make sure there's a balance there within those programs. So if, if your question is, are we taking that into consideration? The answer is yes. And the answer to the DLI question is, if a school wants to remember a lot of those schools took on DLI because they thought it would attract more students to their school population. But if you go look at that student mobility data, what it's actually done is denigrated the, uh, the, the local population. They're, getting, they're pulling in a lot more, uh, but to their detriment, some, some of those English programs, there's an imbalance. And so we've got to help and provide support to those schools. Regardless of this process and population and boundaries, we need to provide better support to our DLI programs. And we're looking into that as well. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I'll come back to you if that's, if that's okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to put this other one down so we don't have that awful noise that gets made when you have too many microphones too close together. Um, so, yes, we analyzed that data and we're pretty good at predicting the future five, six years in advance. After that, it gets a little bit murky. Um, so we went out and we contracted with a private uh, demographer or somebody who studies these things for a living. And what we found is that Granny School District is a mature district. It's doing what was expected to be done. It was founded in 1904. And what you see is school districts will go like this, go like this, go like this. In our case, it was more like this, right? And then they settle about two thirds of their original peak population. So if you think about our peak population, is, so schools do this, school communities do this, and then the district as a whole kind of does this as well. So what you see is Granite School District is starting to settle and we actually expect to lose a few more kids in the next few years. We'll probably settle right around 55,000 kids district-wide. Is there gonna be some additional pockets of growth? Yes, and uh, part of the study takes that into consideration, which is why we're not considering closures in some of the high growth areas that we're seeing, particularly Magna, the Little Valley development, some of those other places. My other question is, are they going to take into consideration the major roads that surround, like for instance, Western Hills is surrounded by 5600 West, 5400 South, 4700 South, and railroad tracks. Um, granted, there is an overpass, but you know, to get that amount of traffic across 5600 West would require a light, you know, yeah. to, to be able to move everybody up to Silver Hills if that were the plan. I've lived here long enough that I've seen way too many pedestrian, auto pedestrian accidents and fatalities that I'm, you know, I don't have kids, but I would hate, to, I love kids, and I would hate to see someone killed 
out on the highway trying to get to school, or someone having to be worried about getting transported by a bus to school, um, because in some parts of Western Hills community, it's a good mile up to Silver Hill. It's not just a short little jaunt. It is. So, I want to be clear. There's some assumptions being made here that the district has not even begun to evaluate. Well, like but there, there are natural assumptions, right? Well, it and so, kind of alludes to that. Fact yeah. As well. and so, there are some challenges. And if you look on the, can you go to the slide? It talks about the it's one of the last ones. It talks about some of the considerations we. This one right here. This is just a few of the items. There are other items that take into consideration some of the things you just vocalized. One of them is natural geographic boundaries that we just can't overcome, right? Now, but if you look on the eastern portion of, of area two, and to be clear, areas one, two, three, four, five, we're all designated by our independent demographer for breaking down those populations. They're not tied to networks. They're not, they're wholesale. They were given to us by this consultant as a way to evaluate and study uh, moving forward. So one of those challenges and considerations is that some of our schools unfortunately have some very um, defined narrow geographic areas that kids simply cannot cross. And so transportation will have to be a consideration in terms of a hazardous route, potentially. That's why we have the Director of Transportation on our PAC committee. That's why we have other individuals with, with, with traffic safety experience and who oversee our safe walking routes that be part of this process to help us draw some conclusions. And your feedback, again, is noted. And uh, we'll certainly take that into consideration. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. You guys love this side. I just pointed out there's another microphone over there. It's only been used once. So go ahead, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dr. Mindy Hennifer. And I chose to come to the west side and teach, even though I live in Sandy. So it's quite of a commute, 16 years ago. And one of the main reasons I chose to do that is because my school has a fabulous and giant sense of community. And that does not just include the residents, that is the faculty as well. And I noticed we were chuckling a little bit about when you brought up all the small school concerns. Um, that's not true of all small schools, just so you know. I just want you to take that um, into Noted. consideration. And I, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. I just want to vocalize that again. Just because we see small concerns in the aggregate doesn't mean that they're all specific to every small school, right? Are we all clear on that? I know that. PAC knows that. We've seen it. We understand that. So thank you for clarifying and giving me a chance to do so. Well, that brings me to my question. How are you rating the sense of community in each area? Not only by the faculty, but by the residents. So, can you go back to my quantitative chart? And it's not mine, our. So this is where we start, quantitative data, right? It's always good to look at the data, but does this tell the whole story? Not even close. No, that's why we're here tonight. We're here to get the qualitative information to help us know and understand about each, not just Western Hills, right. but we want every to know community that could yeah. be potentially impacted by a boundary adjustment. We want to know the things that we don't know, right? I don't know what I don't know, and I would be remiss if I were to make a recommendation to the Board of Education or to make a recommendation to PAC and have them analyze it without knowing what you know. So I'm here to pick your brains tonight, right? So you will not see us make any recommendations. Uh, when we went through this process last year, there were a lot of people, where's your recommendations? I came to see your recommendation. I don't have any recommendations yet. We've not even started scratching the surface on recommendations because we have to have this conversation first, right? So, do you have any idea? I, qualitative data is based on every comment that we receive and every question that's raised. Um, and all these other pieces that are brought to our attention by you as stakeholders, uh, by our community leaders that we visit with. Um, I'll be going out to the Kearns Metro Township in a week or two. I can't remember what I'm scheduled to go up there. I go and visit with each of these respective bodies to get their input and feedback. Can we just have a quick vote here? Does anybody like closing schools? Raise your hands if you really love closing a good school closure. Come on, get those hands high. I've not quite seen them. I know it's really bright in here. Okay. These are awful decisions, guys. 
Nobody likes going through this, right? But either way, we need to have these conversations. If quality educational outcomes are, is what we're after, then we do need to evaluate some of these things that provide challenges or barriers to that, right? Very true. One last quick note. I think if you had a platform, an idea, something that we can all get behind, and we know that we're not going to lose our sense of community, we wouldn't care where the building is. Absolutely, I agree with that. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, I don't either. And let me tell you, community is people. It's not a building. And I think you just said that, right? So let me let me come speak. I want to say two more things with respect to that question because I think they'll help answer it. Um, the first and foremost is I've been personally, how many times have I been to your faculty meetings? Okay, I know, I, I walk into Western Hills, I know what Western Hills is about, okay? So I want to be clear about that. I love what's happening there, I see, uh, I see what's happening there, I can feel what's happening there, okay? But I can also feel that in a number of other places, and there are places that I don't feel it. Right. Yeah. Right? So, but I want to get that out of that. That might be a way that I could measure that, but I'm not the one making this decision, am I? I'm one member of a 30 plus member committee. So all these other things, there's a lot of other qualitative data that help go into that as well, right? And, and again, I really don't even participate in those votes because I let the PAC kind of disaggregate the information and take into consideration all the comments we've solicited and really draw some of their conclusions and I just try to be there. And how does the committee, well I was at that meeting, let me tell you how they feel about this or how they feel about that. I try to kind of convey some of those things that's my role in that process. Um, the second part of this is speaks to community as a whole. Mill Creek Elementary, small school. It was it's slated for closure, right? And you know what? That community, they're what, 227 kids? Pretty small school, right? And they could have, they could have as a staff and as a community as a whole, one of the strongest PTAs I've ever seen in my whole life. I've been around for a while. Right, and I've worked with a lot of PTAs. But they have embraced this idea of joining with a new community, which is the William Penn community. They, we have worked with them to transition. They have held joint meetings just this last uh, Monday. This was last night, I can't remember. What day is it? Is it Monday? So this was last Thursday. I don't even know what day it is, okay? I know what day I lost my tooth. I remember that. Okay, but, and I thought that was gonna get better play. Is it really that hot in it's here? Really hot. Okay, I guess it's warm. Okay, so I, they held this beautiful community meeting the other night. They've held joint school community council meetings. Their PTAs have gotten together, started planning for next year. But they held this joint school uh, event to welcome the Mill Creek families. And I got this beautiful email um, saying, you know, we were really worried about whether we would be welcomed into this community. And they have embraced us with open arms. They see our diversity. They want us there in their school community to show them up. And if you look at those numbers, are there some schools that really would love to beef up their enrollment? You better believe they want to expand their community and make it stronger and make it more effective and more impactful to the kids and the families that they serve. So I just want to keep an open mind about whatever ends up happening to know that there is, there is some lemonade to be made out of what will surely be lemons, right? Let them know who will be asking. Very good. Tom Thank you so much. That Appreciate that. <laughs> My name is Saul, and I work for David Corley. <laughs> I work with a really good team. I have a principal that cares a lot, a social worker that does so much. You know, every single Are we talking about Briar? Oh, yeah. I, I know the these things, guys. I've been in your schools. <laughs> have I not been in your school? Okay, she is amazing. She is. And I guess we are a smaller school. And one of my concerns is, or question, is that you said that kids necessarily do better. Um, in a bigger school, are we talking academically or emotionally as well? Uh, both. And uh, again, we're looking at data in the aggregate, 
And certainly there are exceptions for small schools you know, for a variety of reasons, right? So would you go back to the small school concern slide, the first one I want to say? Dana is amazing, by the way. Can we give her and Julianne a round of applause for all their work tonight? Okay. When I look at this chart and I look at David Gorley's numbers, do I know, think all of these things apply to David Gorley? That is clearly not the case because your academic outcomes would prove otherwise, right? Okay. So and when our PAC meets to discuss those things, certainly that would be a topic of conversation, right? But at the same time, are your numbers, can we go back to the other, to the number chart again? Your numbers are lower than we would like them to be. And we know that if we added some more people to your team, mm -hmm. that that would not only produce more options and opportunities for families, right? Um, but it would also provide a, a larger volunteer base, potentially. Um, it would give you more parents to pull volunteers from, to staff your PTA, staff your school community council. How many people do you have on your school community council, Briar? Two. She needs at least four parents. Are you struggling to find parents? Okay. They want to. Yeah, I'm just pointing out that there are challenges, right? Am I saying they're going to get closed? I don't know that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. But I would also point out that, in as much as you're doing well in terms of student outcomes, could it be better? Every one of these schools could be better. They could. All right. Even our best schools can be better. Right? And we want to give every school community the chance to be the best it can be. And we know that small schools struggle with that. So that's what we're here to address. And just because your your numbers are in the, what is that, green? I don't know. Maybe I'm just hungry. Uh, or yellow, or red, does that mean you're going to be closed? No. We're not going to, we're looking in this area for this study period, one to two closures across 27 schools. Okay, so um, will we have to come back at some point? Yes. Uh, the independent demographer indicated that we would need to close about 12 to 14 elementaries. We've closed six. What's that? And we we haven't we haven't set a deadline to. They must be closed. <laughs> so it we're just taking our time working through this process because if we were to kind of go through this process district wide and. Cut, there's just too many dominoes that fall when you change or adjust a boundary. And it takes anywhere between four to six years for us to see the full efficacy of a boundary change too. Meaning because of open enrollment laws, right, to see what that new boundary does, it takes a little bit of time for it to see its full impact, right? So we would want to take all those things into consideration. And I would, if I'm looking at this right now, I, I'm wanting to shore up as many schools as I can as part of this process. Are we going to be, when we get through the end of this year, are all these schools that are left going to be at 550 plus? No. So we will have to come back in subsequent years and make additional adjustments. When we were done closing three schools out of nine in area four, we still had one or two of those schools that were under 550, and we'll have to come back and make additional adjustments down the road. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make one more comment. All right. Back on. As I've long been, as I answer the questions. <laughs> I mean, I've been with Granite like since I was little. I went to West Valley. Thank you for being here, by the way. Madison, Hunter High School. Um, but as I've seen, um, generally, like when it is a bigger school, a lot of families that are, you know, bilingual or other things, they aren't fully aware of like things that are happening in the community. So I know you have a translator here and whatnot, but I do believe that we could do a bit more to reach out to our community because I don't know how many people are here that speak Spanish, but I do feel like other communities need to know as well, like, you know, of all ethnicities, all um, nationalities, um, to be fully aware to get like the whole experience because you're getting mostly English-based comments and I feel like we need way more languages. You're, you, you're spot on. And if anybody in this room can tell me how I can do a better job of reaching out to those communities, I'm so open to this. All this information on our website is available in 100 plus languages. Um, we have pushed out content um, in various languages to the best of our ability. But I find 
our most impactful uh, opportunity is going to where our communities are instead of making them come to us. And so we're looking for any and all opportunities, not just this spring, but next fall when we actually have some recommendations. You can imagine as we are studying South Salt Lake and the Mill Creek area, we have a high degree of refugee populations. The challenge was even more uh, ever present. And so I wish I had a magic wand to magically engage everybody in this process, but the fact is a lot of our families are struggling. They have to go to work. They have uh, two or three jobs. They have a lot of other challenges on their plate. And so we're just doing the best we can. We will send this information and actually solicit information via an electronic survey on their phone. Uh, they can take in the language of their choice, but if you have other suggestions, very open to that. Thank you. Thank you. So we have our friend here. Um, it's a 734. How many, is there other questions? I want to make sure. Raise your hands. There's other people who have other questions. Okay, we're going to consider this our last question for the regular meeting. But I'm still going to stay up here and hang out for a little bit longer and make sure your, the rest of your questions get answered if you feel more comfortable asking that one-on-one. -on -one. And then I also want to point out that if we call the main line, 385-646-5000, and you ask for Ben and Steve, they know how to find us. You can call us anytime. You can email boundaries at, do you have that contact information slide again, please? Our email address, was, right, uh, go back one, sorry. This was the, the, that's the QR code on the mailer that was sent out. It has the website, and on the website, there's an email address, there's a survey you can take right there and provide feedback. There's lots of different ways to get your question answered and or provide us feedback. So please, 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 do not leave this meeting with a question unanswered, right? Let's make sure your questions get answered. And last but not least, is everybody within area one or two at this meeting tonight? Everybody here who has a question or concern about this to, here tonight? No. So we've recorded this meeting. We'll post that to the website. We'll share all that again with the broader community. If some of you are going to walk away and go spread some juicy rumors, that's fine. That's your prerogative, right? But I would hope you would refer people to these resources and to call Ben and to call Steve and make sure your questions get answered. So, sorry, I may just stand up here for all that, but I just want to make sure, I don't want anybody to leave tonight and feel like that, man, that was a waste of my time. I didn't get my question answered. So my question is from the comment before, um, I wanted to ask you in, oh, by the way, my name is Lily and I work at Western Hills. <laughs> I'm in the Family Engagement Center. <laughs> And um, my question was, do you hold these meetings in Spanish? Okay. So uh, that's a great question. And the answer is no. We have a translator here okay. to assist us with that. But let me tell you, we'll hold these initial meetings, and then we will come back and offer up as any other additional meetings if you want. If you feel like you could uh, get some additional Spanish-speaking families, that's why I asked that gentleman from Borley um, uh, to, if you've got other suggestions. We held 90 meetings as part of last year's study, and that meant going out multiple times to various communities to make sure there was opportunities for questions to be answered. So one of those, like we went out to the Bud Bailey Apartments, which is where a large refugee population is housed, we had four different translators with little groups of families, and we sat there for an hour and a half and just answered questions. So whatever it takes to make sure that we're giving everybody the opportunity uh, you can even e email us questions in your language of choice, and we will respond in your language of choice. And our website can be translated in over to a, over 100 different languages. So that's why a lot of that data on there is not in PDF form, because that would prohibit it from being translated, and we want it to be translated. And the reason for my question is because I had a lot of parents here that only speak Spanish. Uh -huh. So they pretty much didn't understand much of what went on. They sure. Only saw the so I, that's probably my bad. We do have a translator here, and I, I'm again happy to sit around and answer questions after the fact uh, with the trend. With Gonzalo, Gonzalo, raise your hand. Everybody see Gonzalo back there? He's our translator from the district. So if there's specific questions you might have, please let's make sure those questions get answered in whatever language is appropriate. Well, the only suggestion will be next 
next time you can do, like you said, the group, like to have somebody there in Spanish so they can translate because I didn't have a lot of Thank you. I should have done that at the beginning of the meeting. I did that at another location. I didn't do it tonight. I apologize. The next meeting will be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, with that, we're going to formally end the meeting. I'm going to put the microphone down and then I'm going to stand right here. So if there's other specific questions one-on-one -on -one that you'd like to answer, please feel free to come up and we'll make sure that those get taken care of. Thank you all for being here tonight. Would you please give yourselves a round of applause for being engaged in this class?